everyone today we will be dealing with acute kidney injury this is dr aditya sibhi chakravarti from dr talks today we will be dealing with the second topic in nephrology that is the acute kidney injury so we will, as usual we will start with a case scenario a 50 year old male who has got no comorbidities came to the casualty with the complaints of snake bite uh, query russell's viper bite for before 3 days for the past two days, the patient is having complaints of pain, swelling, redness in his left leg, associated with regional lingual lymph node tenderness. His WBCT, initial WBCT was prolonged. Uh, the patient had uh, increased cellulitis, uh, increasing trend of cellulitis. First day, it was below knee. The second day, it was involving above knee. And it was gradually involving the thigh region. It's a progressive cellulitis. Uh, the patient was initially managed with Anti-ASV was given, anti-snake venom was given, antibiotics were given, piperazilin tazobactam antibiotic was given uh, to for the progressive cellulitis. Despite this statement, uh, two days later, the patient developed complaints of decrease in urine output with complaints of back pain for the past 12 hours. Uh, then the patient was given adequate IV fluids and diuretics. The fluid challenge did not open up his kidney. He went in for de progressive decrease in urine output and high colored urine was passing. So, uh, on examination, he just had findings of local cellulitis. The general and systemic examination were uneventful. Uh, the baseline investigation is first day urea creatinine was just 30 and 0.8, and the third day urea creatinine investigation uh, worsened. His urea work became 110, and his creatinine became uh, value of 4, and his potassium became 6.9. Uh, and his urine output was just 90 ml for the past 24 hours. Uh, ultrasound uh, USG abdomen was done. USG abdomen showed a normal kidney and uh, urine routine showed granular uh, granular cast with uh, eosinophils uh, with the RBCs uh, with RBCs um, granular cast was seen. Uh, so patient was diagnosed as acute kidney injury and uh, patient was started on dialysis. Once two to three days of dial two to three sittings of dialysis, the patient's general condition improved, and then uh, he was discharged. So, so this is the uh, case history of acute kidney injury. So, far I have to define what is this acute kidney injury. Acute kidney injury can be defined based on two findings: the patient will have a decrease in urine output. The urine output will be very low and the serum creatinine will increase. These are the two findings which are pertinent for acute kidney injury. A decrease in urine output and an increase in serum creatinine. This urine output should be less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour for more than at least minimum of 6, hours, six to 12 hours. This is not, but the serum creatinine should increase by 1.5 to 2 times the baseline serum creatinine. So, this is the two creatinine. Uh, urine output of less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour for more than 6 hours and the raised serum creatinine more than 1.5 to 2 times the baseline serum creatinine. So, the second point, what is how do you differentiate an acute kidney injury from a chronic kidney disease? The acute kidney injury, basically the patient will be usually a normal healthy being before the event. Uh, in a chronic kidney disease, however, the patient will have findings of anemia, bone mineral disease, hyperkalemia, ultrasound evidence of shrunken kidneys, uh, then the patient will go for uremic symptoms, all these things for a long period of time, more than 3 months. Then that is then that is the classical CKD patient. Whereas an AKA patient will usually be a normal patient, or the AKA can be super uh, super rare on a chronic kidney disease patient. Now we will deal with the causes of AKA. So this is the definition of acute kidney injury. So what are the causes of AKA? The AKA can be classified into three types, namely pre-renal. renal and post renal these are the three basic classification of the causes of kidney injuries the pre renal can be because of vomiting the patient can have loose stools the patient can have blood loss hemorrhagic blood loss or there can be uh, uh, because of congestive cardiac failure or this can be because of liver cell uh, liver failure uh, this can be secondary to drugs like AC inhibitors, 
ARBs and NSAIDs. So these are the causes of pre-renal AKG. Pre-renal literally means there is a decrease in circulating blood volume. So the renal blood flow will be decreased. And as a, as a result of decreased renal blood flow, the GFR will be low. And there will be accumulation of these endogenous waste products. That is what we call as pre-renal AKG. It can occur, occur secondary to any of these above condition. The renal, the most important one, uh, the most important one of can be classified based on the structure that involves. Either it can involve the glomerulus. Glomerulus can be involved, involved as the acute glomerular nephritis or nephrotic syndrome. Uh, the glomerulus can be involved. Then the vas vassal. Vascular can be either the large vessel or the small vessel. A large vessel disease predominantly includes a lot of aliens like renal artery stenosis, uh, renal vein thrombosis. Uh, the uh, fiber, uh, patient with uh, Abdominal compartment syndrome, abdominal compartment syndrome, renal artery stenosis, renal vein uh, uh, renal artery stenosis, renal vein thrombosis, abdominal compartment syndrome, renal artery dissection, anything and this is the large vessel causes of uh, AKA. The small vessel again includes uh, TTP or HUS, this is thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura or hemorrhagic remix syndrome, DAC or it can be because of malignant hypertension. This can be secondary to calcineurin inhibitors. Tacrolimus, those group of drugs, uh, calcineurin inhibitor, or it can be secondary to sepsis, or this uh, small vessel disease uh, can occur because of atheroembolism. Then it can also involve the uh, interstitium. The uh, interstitium can be involved. Interstitium can be involved secondary to either. It this can be an infection. Infection, either sepsis or pyelonephritis or a legionella infection, or this can be because of infiltration. Infiltration secondary to leukemia or a lymphoma, or it is can be secondary to allergic, allergic response to drugs like uh, rifampicin, proton pump inhibitors, this group of drugs, or this can be secondary to inflammatory conditions like Jogren syndrome, or uh, to, uh, the Jogren syndrome. So interstitial involvement, it can be secondary to infections like sepsis, pyelonephritis or legionella. Infiltration, leukemia and lymphoma infiltration, allergic allergic to uh, uh, drugs like uh, PPI, proton pump inhibitors, NSAIDs, inflammatory namely Jogren syndrome. This is the interstitial cause. Then we will go for, uh, to, uh, this is the large vessels, vascular, glomerular, vascular, tubular. Tubular is the fourth group of causes. Tubular, this tubular can either be, become, uh, there can be sepsis, secondary to sepsis. Or this can be secondary to infection or it can be secondary to ischemia or it can be secondary to toxin. This toxin which is causes the uh, tubular injury can either be endogenous or it can be exogenous toxins. Exogenous toxins in the form of uh, administered cisplatin or uh, nephro on the dyes which are used for uh, imaging or it can be secondary to the antibiotics. Uh, these are endo exogenous cause of toxins. The endogenous toxins include the hemoglobin, myoglobin, uric acid, light chains, all these things can cause endogenous causes of uh, hormonal toxin induced aka. So this is the pre-renal. Now we will go for post-renal causes. Post-renal, namely these are predominantly the urological causes. Obstruction. Obstruction can be because of some urethral structures or it can be secondary to prostate disease in men. It can be benign prostatic hypertrophy or prostatic carcinoma, the prostate disease. Or it can be because of a obstructed urinary uh, catheter. That can be a cause. Or it can be because of secondary to renal stones or ureteric stones or bladder stones. It can be because of a sloughed renal papillae. Sloughed renal papillae secondary to analgesic nephropathy or this can be secondary to a blood clot causing uh, uretric obstructions. So any these are the basic causes of uh, acute kidney injury. We are class with this pre-renal, renal, post-renal, pre-renal post because of any blood loss, vomiting, diarrhea, loose stools or third space loss in the form of nephrotic in congestive cardiac failure or a uh, decompensated liver disease or secondary to drugs like AC inhibitors, ARBs. And, uh, and uh, NSAIDs. This is the pre-renal cause. Renal, 
uh, we classify it into vascular, interstitial, glomerular and tubular. Vascular, it can be secondary to large vessel or small vessel. Large vessel, renal artery thrombosis, renal vein thrombosis uh, or uh, small or abdominal compartment syndrome. Small vessel in the form of HUS, TTP or uh, malignant hypertension, etc. Or it can be because of interstitium, interstitium allergic, inflammatory, infectious or ischemic or it can be secondary to tubular, tubular because of sepsis or infection or ischemia or toxin, toxin, endogenous, exogenous, anything can be possible or posterior because of obstruction to the urine outflow. So this is the list of causes which can produce acute kidney injury. We will be dealing in uh, some detail about some of the most important of these uh, causes. So first we will start with the pre-renal cause. Pre-renal There are two conditions, the hepatorenal syndrome 1 and hepatorenal syndrome 2. Hepatorenal syndrome type 1 is a more severe disease. So what, why this hepatorenal syndrome occurs? This is because in a patient with uh, decompensated liver disease, cirrhosis patient, there will be splanchnic vasodilatation. There will be loss of systemic vascular resistance and splanchnic vasodilatation. So much of the blood will be trapped within this splanchnic circulation. So the patient's effective circulating blood volume will decrease. Because of the decrease effective circulating blood volume, the renal blood flow will decrease. So the patient can have AKA-like presentation. There won't be any structural problem with the kidney. They can only present the AKA-like presentation in advanced cirrhosis patients. So uh, this type 1 is more malignant. It has got a rapid increase in creatinine by 2.5 to 3 times. Or acute worsening in renal function test can be required. And the patient may require dialysis in most of the cases. The type 2 epidural syndrome, however, is a milder form where the patient only presents with refractory ascites. Uh, this can be uh, made worse with the presence of a spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Uh, so, how do you manage this hepatorenal syndrome? You have to go for orthotopic liver transplantation. That is the treatment of choice. But before going to treatment, you can try drugs like IV albumin, 25 mg or 50 mg can be given, or uh, drugs which increase systemic vascular resistance like norepinephrine, midodrin, which is an alpha agonist, or uh, octreotide or somatostatin. Any drug can be used. So, this is the hepatorenal syndrome. Then, you have to go for what is known as the myogenic reflex. So what is this myogenic reflex? Uh, myogenic reflex means when the renal uh, glomerular the renal blood flow decreases, this is sensed by the renal afferent arteriole and there will be release of uh, substance like prostaglandins, kinins, bradykinin, all this are uh, nitric oxide. This release of this prostaglandins will cause afferent vasodilatation. Because of this afferent vasodilatation, uh, this will increase in the glomerular filtration rate. So, this is called as myogenic reflex. It is mediated by the prostaglandins. So, uh, so when we give uh, NSAIDs uh, like uh, Bucel, like uh, aspirin or paras aspirin, paracetamol, this uh, prostaglandin production uh, will be affected. Because when the prostaglandin production is affected, there will be decrease in afferent, afferent vasodilatation and uh, decrease in GFR. This is my, uh, myogenic reflex. And then, role of angiotensin 2. So, what does angiotensin 2? Again, the renal afferent arterial has got the JG cells, the juxtaglomerular cells. They secrete renin in response to low perfusion pressure. This renin will activate the angiotensin 2. This angiotensin 2 will cause efferent vasoconstriction and cause increase in the GFR. Uh, we can increase the GFR by two mechanisms, either by afferent vasodilatation or efferent vasoconstriction. So, if this is the afferent arteriole, this is the glomerular capillaries and uh, this is the efferent arteriole. And this is the uh, this is the tubules, they are the capillaries sustaining. If either by dilating this afferent arteriole or by constricting the afferent arteriole, we can increase the intraglomerular pressure. Thereby, increase in the intraglomerular hydrostatic pressure will increase the uh, glomerular filtration rate. This is the protective mechanism. When we use AC inhibitors like uh, enalapril or losartan like. Uh, uh, ARBs, this angiotensin 2 will be blocked and renal efferent vasodilatation will be blocked. So, uh, they are contra the AC inhibitors are contraindicated in patients with bilateral renal artery stenosis. The other thing you have to go for is the tubuloglomerular feedback. What is this tubuloglomerular feedback? Uh, this means the tubules, in the tubules in the distal convoluted tubule, they have a specialized cell called as macula densa cell. This macula densa cell can identify when there is increased solute delivery 
uh, to the um, macrodensa cell, it will cause the release of adenosine and will cause afferent vasoconstriction and vice versa in the opposite mechanism. So this tubular glomerular feedback will be the uh, will protect the kidney against this harmful toxins and it is a protective mechanism. During when there is activation of this tubular glomerular feedback, the patients will have a decrease in urine output and there will be increase in serum creatinine and the electrolyte panels go for worsen. All the acute problem with AK occur during due to this tubular glomerular feedback but however they are protective. Then other uh, thing are the cardiorenal syndrome. Cardiorenal syndrome type 1 and type 2. Second, uh, cardiorenal syndrome type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, type 5 types of that. First two is the cardiorenal, the third and fourth are renocardial. Uh, acute uh, cardio ACS causing AK or an uh, acute uh, kidney injury causing an um, acute heart disease. They are, uh, they are the uh, cardiorenal syndromes. So the, we will uh, decide, and then we will discuss with the intrinsic renal failure. As we all know, we have classified intrinsic into glomerular, tubular, interstitial, and vascular problems. Vascular large vessel, small vessel, and we'll, we have already discussed the causes. We'll just be dealing with the most important ones. First one was the sepsis. And because there is sepsis, there is uh, a state of systemic inflammatory response in sepsis. There is more bacteria in the blood and there is more inflammatory response in, uh, to those bacteria. There is increased production of cytokines. The cytokines will cause the renal efferent vasodilatation. And also the septic organs can directly injure the proximal convoluted tubule. And there can be, uh, because of the antibiotics are used in sepsis, can also worsen the AKI. This sepsis can be secondary to any infection like pneumonia or neuronary attack infection. Uh, they, and are... Uh, Pneumonia and neurodiagnostic infection are more important causes of sepsis. Then second one we will be dealing with the ischemia. The renal cortex, the kidney receives 20% of the uh, output from the heart. Especially the renal cortex. If this is, just imagine this is the cortex and this is the medulla. The renal cortex has got abundant blood supply. Uh, from the uh, renal arteries whereas the renal medulla is notoriously hypoxic this outer medullary area uh, where uh, this outer medullary area this area the patient the both the kidneys are metabolically active as well as there is de decrease in uh, blood supply so it is more vulnerable for ischemia the s3 component of the proximal s3 of the proximal converted tubule uh, this is the most hypoxic, uh, this is the most important side to get hypoxic injury. So this is this ischemia or it can be secondary to vascular, large vessel and small vessel. Large vessel, uh, a small vessel as we have already mentioned, it can be secondary to hemolytic uremic syndrome, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, small vessel. HUS or TTP. HUS has a classical trait of anemia, renal failure, thrombocytopenia. There will be a, uh, there are two types of HUS, typical and atypical HUS. Typical HUS can occur secondary to a, a gastroenteritis or a pneumonia by, a, uh, by E. coli or a, a streptococcus pneumonia. This will be occurring one week before the actual infection. After one week after uh, this infection, the patient will develop anemia raising in the urea creatinine concentration there will be evidence of schistocytes in peripheral bed smear there will be increase in ldh uh, this is the classical uh, hus the uh, atypical hus can be due to the activation of the alternate complement pathway due to mutation factor h factor i and factor b mutation hus can should be managed by plasmapheresis uh, and uh, the, there is no role for steroids and then uh, other uh, Problems which can cause uh, acute tubular This is the post-op cases. Major surgeries uh, which can cause hypotension and increased blood loss during intraoperative period, they can increase the risk of AK in post-op uh, patients. The most important surgeries are the cardiac surgery or the valve surgery or uh, the patient secondary to intraperitoneal major intraperitoneal procedures. Uh, high risk patients are those with diabetes mellitus, those with advanced age, CKD patients. They can also develop this uh, post-op AKA. Then, atheroembolism. A 
in any patient with extensive atherosclerosis of the aorta of the major arteries if we go for some endovascular procedures this will result in disruption of the small atherosclerotic blocks and they get deposited in various tissues they can present as levator reticularis or uh, blocks in the retina or subacute renal failure presenting somewhat late one to one week after the one to two weeks after the procedure and can peak up after one month after the procedure and there is biconvex cholesterol crystals seen in renal biopsy this is atheroembolism and then we'll go for toxins uh, the first uh, we'll be dealing with the contrast contrast induced acute kidney injury this contrast in the contrast is usually given for any CECT procedures or any cardiovascular imaging procedures this contrast has got an intrinsic problem to, to cause kidneys in a normal patient with a good kidney yeah, there won't be much complications but in a patient who is an elderly patient with some problems of the CKD uh, they can cause havoc in those patients the creatinine concentration will after giving the IV contrast usually the high osmolar IV contrast 2 to 3 days, uh, 24 to 48 hours later, the creatinine starts to peak and it peaks at 5th day after uh, administration and falls down by 7th day. Uh, this can be uh, this creatinine, this, sorry, this uh, contrast can cause 3 damages. First one, they will cause afferent vasoconstriction. Second one, they can cause medullary hypoxia. Third one, they can cause normal proximal convertible injury. This contrast in AK can be prevented by vigorous hydration before uh, giving contrast and after giving contrast and it can go for uh, NSL system administration. What is nephrogenic systemic fibrosis? Nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. What is this? Uh, again, in a patient who has got a poor EGFR, less than 30, 30, 30 ml per minute, if you are going uh, to administer gadolinium for uh, doing an MRI, this can trigger a systemic inflammatory response in the form of diffuse subcutaneous uh, induration. This is called as nephrogenic fi uh, systemic fibrosis and it is one of the deadly prognosis in, uh, with MRI administrations. Then, we will go for antibiotics. What are the antibiotics? What are the antibiotics that can cause AKI? Aminoglycoside, amphotericin B, acyclovir. These are can cause dose dependent uh, damage to the renal tubules. Then certain drugs like penicillins, cephalosporins, uh, they can cause allergic interstitial nephritis in the form of fever, rashes, and uh, the patient can have uh, acute drop in the renal function test along with fever and rash. So this is the antibiotics causing Okay, then the chemotherapy drugs. Chemotherapy drugs in the form of cisplatin, carboplatin, iphosphamide, uh, bevacizumab, uh, mitomycin, gemcitabin. All these drugs can cause acute kidney injury. Then we will go for toxins. So what are the toxins? Toxins first one will be the endogenous toxins we will dealing with. There are four main endogenous products that can act as toxins to the kidneys. They are uh, uric acid. Uric acid is raised in a setting of tumor lysis syndrome. When you go for aggressive treatment of uh, acute lymphobus leukemia or some malignancy, uh, there will be increased destruction of the malignant cells resulting in production of increase in uric acid. Along with that there will be hyperkalemia hypermagnesemia, hypocalcemia, hyperphosphatemia with hyperuricemia. This uric, hyperuric acid can cause, cause crystallization within the renal tubules as well as they cause direct tubulotoxicity can result in AKA-like picture. This tumor lysis syndrome can be prevented by aggressive hydration before the procedures and use of drugs like rasburicase, pegloticase and, or you can, go for, uh, so you can go for drugs that reduce the cell count before administering uh, this uh, uh, anti-chemotherapy drugs like hydroxyurea. Hydroxyurea can reduce the cell count. So once you reduce the cell count, then you can go for chemotherapy. So that is the uric acid. TL is the first one. Then go for rhabdomyolysis. Rhabdomyolysis following a trauma or a crush injury or an electric shock injury or following um, significant damasal damage, there will be release of myoglobin. Uh, this uh, rhabdomyolysis similar is present with similar to tumor lysis. Only exception is that there will be increase in CKMB. There will be acute onset muscle pain with the decrease in urine output, with increase in uric acid, 
there will be increase in um, hypercalcemia there will be increase in potassium there will be increase in uh, increase in phosphorus decrease in calcium uh, this rhabdomyolysis can also be prefer treated with aggressive hydration plus urinary alkalination with the help of sodium bicarbonate where nothing works you know for dialysis in the, both these patients then this can be to do myeloma of kidney in myeloma of kidney there will be increased production of light chain this light chain can cause light chain cause nephropathy can result in acute renal failure then the other uh, this is the major endogenous tubular toxicity what are the exogenous toxins namely the ethylene glycol ethylene glycol is used as an anti uh, automobile an um, anti freeze in automobile industries this ethylene glycol is metabolized to glycolic acid and glycaldehyde that is directly tubular toxic and can cause intertubular obstruction this can cause uh, acute kidney injury there will be increase in the osmolal gap and increase in the anion gap uh, increase anion gap increase osmolal gap uh, there will be seen in ethylene glycol poisoning the other poison can be diethylene glycol this is commonly seen as a contaminant in drugs pharmaceutical industries and then it can be second to you know, so melamin melamin is used as a food preservative uh, industries and that can also sometimes cause acute kidney injury then aristolachic acid aristolachic acid can also cause acute kidney injury it is also called as chinese herb nephropathy uh, then it can be secondary to involvement of glomerulonephritis glomerulonephritis acute glomerulonephritis anything can produce as acute kidney injury so we have dealt in detail about the causes of acute kidney injury now we will be dealing with how do you approach a case of acute kidney injury the first uh, stage in approaching an acute kidney injury will be uh, you have to classify uh, the acute kidney injury the, this is given by the kdigo classification this is very important the kdigo classification for the early stage one stage two and stage three first you will have to go for a uh, urine output the urine output will be less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour for more than six hours six to twelve hours this is less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour for less than 24 hours or here it is less than uh, 0.3 ml per kg per hour for uh, more for uh, less than for more than 12 hours or complete anuria for more than 24 hours or complete anuria for more than 12 hours so this is the three staging based on the urine output you can also classify based on the creatinine value it is 1.5 times to 1.9 times a baseline creatinine that is stage 1 2 to 2.9 times baseline creatinine this is stage 2 uh, more than or equal to 3 times baseline creatine or if you start for the renal replacement therapy or if you go for uh, dialysis i mean dialysis are the absolute value is more than 4 mg per deciliter this is the classification of AKG. if the urine output is uh, less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour for less than 12 hours or if the urine output is more than uh, less than 0.5 ml per kg for uh, less than 24 hours or if the urine output is less than 0.3 ml per kg per hour for more than 24 hours this is the uh, urine output classification creatinine 1.5 to 1.9 times the baseline 2 to 2.9 times the baseline more than 3 times the baseline or indication for dialysis this is the classification of acute kidney injury So, what are the, how do you approach a case of acute kidney injury? So, you have this AKA by definition. If this AKA plus if the patient has got history of vomiting, loose stools, diarrhea, blood loss, 
then uh, you, got, you can classify it as a pre-renal AKI. Then you have to look for the signs of pre-renal AKI in the form of hypotension, dehydration, decreased skin turgor, low jugular venous pulse, tachycardia. This will be seen in a pre-renal AKI. Then what are the history, uh, if the patient is having AKI with the history of loin pain, relating to the loin pain, you have to think of renal colic. If the patient is of AKI with the history of any prostate disease, or uh, nocturia, hematuria, frequency, increased frequency of mixturation during the night or increased frequency of mixturation throughout the day uh, then you have to think of prostatic disease or you have to think in terms of bladder outlet obstructions if the patient is having such symptoms so suppose the patient is having AKA with the history of fever, rashes then you have to think in terms of allergic industrial nephritis or AKA with the history evidence of uh, glomer AKA with the evidence of petechial skin rashes with the help of sinusitis or hemoptysis then you have to think in terms of uh, vasculitis. Uh, these are the uh, common uh, appro uh, approach for AKA patients. Then you will diagnose AKA based on the rise and fall in creatinine. So how does creatinine rise? Different conditions have got various rate of rise and fall in creatinine. Suppose uh, the patient with the perirenal AK will have only moderate rise in creatinine and that falls back to normal with the hemodynamic improvement. A patient with a contrast induced AK, they can have uh, the creatinine picking up in 24 for 48 hours, peaks at 5 days and comes back at 7 days. Suppose a patient is having uh, atheroembolic rare disease, it peaks very later. Only after two weeks only, you can have the uh, creatine level picking up. Then, the presence of anemia. If the patient is having severe anemia in the absence of hemolysis, you have to think in terms of hemolytic uremic syndrome or a myeloma or in the case of a thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. If the patient is having significant eosinophilia, significant eosinophilia, you have to think in the term of allergic interstitial nephritis or a patient with Chuck Starr syndrome or a polyarthritis nodosa. This should be thought if there is increase in eosinophil count. If the patient is having metabolic acidosis, that can be seen because in even a normal uremia itself, we can have metabolic acidosis. However, if the patient is having metabolic increase in uh, anion gap, increase anion gap plus increase osmolar gap, you have to think in terms of oxalic acid, I mean uh, ethylene glycol poisoning. If there is increase in, decrease in anion, uh, decrease in anion gap, this is because seen in multiple myeloma, because of increase in the unmeasured anions. Uh, so, this uh, findings will be seen. Then, what are the findings of rhabdomyolysis? Rhabdomyolysis, again as I said, will increase in uric acid, increase in, uh, increase in uric acid, increase in uh, potassium, increase in phosphorus, increase in calcium, decrease in calcium with increase in uric acid and increase in CKMB, the serine rhabdomyolysis. So what are the complications of acute kidney injury? Before going to the complication, we will be seeing, uh, seeing with the urine routine. Uh, what are the findings will be seen in an urine rotten? What are the findings you will see in urine rotten? What is the role of USG? What is the role of markers? The recent markers or what is the role of biopsy? Just a quick review. Biopsy is usually not done in a case of acute kidney injury. If there is a, uh, the, if the cause is very well known, we won't go for biopsy. Biopsy can be done if there is a suspect of glomerular nephritis or an vasculitis or an interstitial nephritis, we can try biopsy. The markers, there are four markers, uh, the, apart from urea keratinine, there are four new markers, namely KIM1, NGAL, lipocalin, it's also called as lipocalin, uh, then uh, tissue inhibitor of matrix metalloproteinase type 2 and uh, insulin-like growth factor binding protein 7, uh, binding protein 7. These are the four markers, recent markers that has been approved for the early diagnosis of AKE and uh, it, this indicates a worse prognosis of AKE. Uh, we can also uh, uh, try fluid challenge test. You have to give uh, um, 40 mg to 80 mg of LASIX and you have to measure the urine output 2 hours later. If the urine output after giving 80 mg of LASIX 2 hours later, if it is just than 200 ml, these patients are high risk of progressing into 
uh, severe AKA. Secondly, if the urine routine shows high number of um, epithelial cells or tubular casts or high number of um, RBCs, then also indicates that these patients are high risk of progressing into severe AKA. They may require dialysis. So, ultrasound. What does ultrasound show? CKD patients will have a contracted kidney and loss of corticomodular differentiation. If these two findings are present, put them under CKD. Uh, however, AKA patients usually have a normal kidney. Uh, it can also give etiology, uh, clue to the etiology of the AKA. Uh, if the patient is having an, uh, a large kidney, with the CKD of the large kidney, think of diabetic nephropathy or an, uh, allerg uh, or an infiltrative disorders and uh, HIV nephropathy. Diabetic nephropathy and HIV nephropathy and infiltrative disorders are of large kidneys. Uh, you have to go for uh, renal arteriography or re renal Doppler. If the patient is having a unilateral shrunken kidney, then uh, renal Doppler can be tried. This urine routine can give multiple findings. The findings of um, broad, there can be granular cast, there can be granular cast, you have to think of acute tubular necrosis. If there is RBC cast, you have to think in terms of glomerulonephritis. If the patient is having eosinophil cast, think in terms of allergic interstitial nephritis or pyelonephritis. If the patient is having WBC cast, this can be because of acute tubular necrosis or pyelonephritis or allergic interstitial nephritis. If the patient is having um, broad waxy cast, Think in terms of chronic kidney disease or nephrotic syndrome. So this uh, this sums up the diagnostic approach. Now, how do you pre differentiate pre-renal from intrinsic renal AKA? Pre-renal versus intrinsic renal. How do you differentiate both these conditions? The pre-renal, basically in pre-renal, the tubules will be normal. So tubules will reabsorb urea and secrete creatinine and the tubule will reabsorb sodium and all the electrolytes will be reabsorbed. So what are the uh, basic difference? Uh, the pre-renal will have an acidot acidic urine, the increase in specific gravity with the increase in osmolarity. The blood will have an inc more of one, the urea creatinine ratio will be increased. Because the urea, will, more urea will be reabsorbed, so blood urea levels will be very high. Whereas the creatinine will be secreted, the creatinine rise will not be that much present in pre-renal AKA. Intrinsic renal AKA will have a uh, presence of uh, albuminuria. Or the patient will have a muddy brown cast. There can be evidence of um, granular cast. But however, they will have an alkaline urine. Their specific gravity will be normal. The osmolarity will be normal. The urea creatinine levels will also be uh, increased. The urea creatinine levels will be in uh, decreased. And the urine sodium, urine sodium level will be decreased here, less than 20. And urine sodium level can be increased and fractional excretion of sodium can also be increased. So this sums up the basic difference between a pre-renal and intrinsic renal aka. So what are the complications aka go into, aka can go into first of all there will be hypervolemia or hypovolemia patient can have hyperkalemia, increase in potassium or increase in magnesium or increase in phosphorus, hyperphosphatemia, uh, phosphorus, the patient can have decrease in the serum calcium or the patient can have decrease in the serum sodium, the patient can have uh, uremic complications, there can be secondary to uh, malnutrition and there can be a lot of cardiac complications. So, these are the basic complications you can see in AKA patients and there will be metabolic acidosis. So, uh, 
hyper olemia why the aka patient go for hyper olemia because there will be decrease in the urine output there will be retention of water and sodium there will be increase in the extracellular fluid volume when the extracellular fluid volume increases the patient will go for pedal edema uh, pulmonary and the intracellular fluid volume increases there will be will go for pulmonary edema pedal edema weight gain all these problems will be there they have to be managed with fluid restriction plus diuretics in the form of loop diuretics or thiazide diuretics if nothing works you have to go for dialysis in hyperolemic patients hypovolemia the in a stage of recovery in the aki there will be increased urinary polyuria will be there this will can this patients will go for hypovolemia this hypovolemia is because of the excretion of retained urea and all the other nitrogenous waste when they are excreted they can go for hypovolemic changes hyperkalemia this hyperkalemia uh, is can occur in acute kidney injury is one of the most worst prognosis in acute kidney injury the more high severe hyperkalemia can be seen in conditions where there is cell lysis like rhabdomyolysis hemor hemolysis tumor lysis syndrome they can have refractory hyperkalemia this hyperkalemia can have cardiac complication and neuromuscular complications uh, basically it is picked up with ecg showing tall t waves and uh, other arrhythmias ventricular arrhythmias can be present uh, hyperkalemia can be uh, managed with dietary potassium restriction or you, you can should reduce the dose of ac inhibitors arbs you should reduce the uh, you should reduce the dose of uh, uh, nsaids should be reduced or you have to improve the your potassium excretion by using caloric diuretics like lasix you should avoid spira uh, the uh, potassium spiring diuretics should be avoided spironolactone epiletronone uh, triamtrin amylorate they should be avoided then you have to go for glucose insulin infusion a 25% dextrose in uh, glucose 25% dextrose in uh, plus a 10 units of insulin you have to go for infusion over one hour and yeah, you can try other methods like sodium polystyrene sulfonate this is a potassium binding resin that can cause potassium elimination if nothing works you have to go for dialysis and removal of uh, potassium inhaled uh, inhaled uh, salbutamol can also be tried but not much effective then the patients with metabolic acidosis metabolic acidosis initially uh, they can have either normal anion gut metabolic acidosis or high anion gut metabolic acidosis this met mild metabolic acidosis you will not treat but if there is severe metabolic acidosis with the ph of less than 7.2 or uh, ph less than 7.1 or 7 or the bicarb of less than 15 or 10 you have to go for sodium bicarbonate replication either tablet sodium bicarbonate or iv sodium bicarbonate they can be given then uh, hyponatremia hyponatremia this can be because of either uh, excess administration of hypotonic fluids or excess administration of isotonic dextrose containing solutions they can cause hyponatremia usually asymptomatic if there is severe hyponatremia they can present with seizure hyponatremia should be managed with sodium restriction uh, you have to go for water restriction water restriction alone is enough there won't be need for any 3% uh, ACL or conivaptan drugs those drugs are usually will not be needed in acute stages then hyperphosphatemia and hypocalcemia this both of them can occur because of a decrease in the GFR lead to hypophosphate retention then this is an extra extra osseous calcification can cause hypercalcemia hypercalcemia can present with tingling numbness perioral paresthesia corpopedal spasms cardiac arrhythmias refractory seizures they can ECG showing QT prolongations and you have to replace calcium gluconate or uh, calcium sulfate if there is hypercalcemic and symptomatic then uremia uh, due to fallen GFR there will be accumulation of nitrogenous waste products in the blood this accumulated nitrogenous waste products apart from urea creatinine there can be lot of other urate hippurate sulfate and other cations and anions they can cause this uremic symptoms if the urea levels are more than 100 they can have symptoms of altered mental sensorium patients can have symptoms of pericarditis patient can have symptoms of gastritis patient can have symptoms of refractory pruritus these things can be present because of uremia then hypermagnesemia is uh, also possible in um, patients with AK you have to go for uh, you should reduce the potassium uh, magnesium containing antacids should be reduced in such patients malnutrition malnutrition is a very common complication that can be seen in patients with uh, acute kidney injury they are uh, they are at high chance of developing uh, infection and inflammation that is very common uh, the protein supplement protein should be given adequately if the patient is on dialysis a protein dose of 1.5 kg gram per kg should be given if the patient is in dialysis and if it's hypercatabolic you have to go for 1.7 gram per kg if the patient is aka not on dialysis just 1 gram per kg is enough uh, 
1.7 if there is hypercatabolism plus dialysis, 1.5 gram per kg if the patient is on dialysis, 1 gram per kg if the patient is on AKI, not on dialysis and not hypercatabolic. Then you have to go for energy supplementation. 20 to 30 kilocalories of energy should be given in patients with uh, hyperkalemia. Now, so, don't you think a patient has the acute kidney injury? Coming to the management of uh, hyperkalemia, management of acute kidney injury. First one, you have to go the general management. You have to uh, reduce the dose of almost all antibiotics and all the drugs based on his creatinine clearance. Second, you should avoid nephrotoxic drugs like AC inhibitors, ARBs. Uh, the other all group, aminoglycosid, amphotericin, all group of nephrotoxic drugs should be avoided in almost all patients with AKI. Then, when do you take up the patient for dialysis? When the patient is having refractory hyperolemia or refractory hyperkalemia, or the patient is having severe metabolic acidosis, or if the patients um, this, uh, you have got any uremic symptoms, or the patient's AK is secondary to some toxins or metals which mandate the need for uh, dialysis. You have to take the patient for dialysis. Then, how uh, then uh, how do you give the fluids? You have to if the patient is hyperolemic, uh, you have to go for uh, diuretics in the form of Lasix, and you should make the uh, reduce the patients. If the patient is hypolemic, you have to maintain the input and output as equal. Uh, for uh, improvement in symptoms. If the patient, unspecific management, if the patient is having some conditions like sclerodermic renal crisis, go for drugs like ACE inhibitors. That is the drug of choice in sclerodermic renal crisis. If the patient is having some allergic interstitial nephritis, allergic interstitial nephritis, allergic nephritis, you have to go for immunosuppressive drugs and steroids. Steroids should be given. After withholding the drugs, you have to go for immunosuppression and steroids. So, this sums up our uh, discussion on acute kidney injury. I hope this was useful. If you found this discussion to be useful, I would like to sh I would like you to share this video with your friends. I would like you to comment how the video was, where, where was is it useful. All these things will be helpful to grow my channel. Thank you.